Thank you so much, Dr. Sfaustino, Zhang, and Chaklea. So for all of our audience, if you can go ahead and put your questions into the right-hand corner, and we will go ahead and get started with the question and answer section. So the question is going to be for Dr. Faustino. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for your presentation. So uh, someone in the audience would like to know, do they need to archive reference standards that are used in method validation and sample analysis? Well, I think you need to keep and you need to maintain the standards during the study. But once the study is done, uh, you'd have to look and see what value you would have, because there's an expiration, expiry date or an expiration date on those standards. So if you kept them, because the standards are going to continue to degrade, um, even if you maintain them at 4, 20, maybe not minus 80, but they're going to continue to degrade. So the value you would have is you'd have some long-term stability. It's really already defined by that expiration date. Great. Thank you so much. So our next question is also for you. The audience would like to know, where can they review the Crystal City Conference report? The title of the conference report, you can just put it in Google, but you can use PubMed or Web of Science. It's going to pop right up. Very easy. So you have the titles, put it into Google, put it into Google Scholar, and they'll pop right up. And as I was mentioning in my presentation, go look at them. There's really a tremendous amount of information that's been condensed in those thinking that's been condensed into those reports. There's a lot of value. And you can, as we talked about, you can see the evolution of the thinking and the guidance. Great. Thank you so much. All right. Our next question is, again, for Dr. Faustino, and then we'll um, move on to our next speaker. When the ICH M10 is final, how do you see the role of the FDA 2018 guidance? Would M10 supersede the FDA 2018 guidance, or would both guidances be in full force? So I'm going to I'm going to kind of sidestep that question a little bit because I'm not the ICH um, point of contact. What I would say is read the conference reports for the 2019 ICH M10 AAPS workshop, AAPS FDA workshop. And then if you have specific questions, and I don't want Brian to get mad at me, but you could go to our point of contact. But I think that conference report, that guidance is still being developed and is still ongoing, so the FDA's domestic guidance is the one in place that you would use. Great. Thank you so much. And we have a lot of questions coming in, so we'll probably come back to you. And right. our next question is Dr. Zane. What is the BPCI uh -huh. Act? OK, BPCI stands for Biological Practice Competition and the Innovation Act of 2009. It provided an abbreviated license pathway for biological products that are demonstrated to be biosimilar to or interchangeable with an FDA-approved biological product. All right, great. Thank you for the answer. And our next question, Dr. Zhang, is what are the critical reagents that they should be aware of? Uh, the reason I brought up this is because critical reagents such as antibodies are very important for lichen binding acid. Okay, great. And another question for you. What is the regulatory perspective on LVA, LC, MS, slash MS? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, talking about hybrid LBA LC MS uh, please download my slide. And uh, in the last slide of my presentation, I provided two reference paper. One paper is an editorial paper entitled Hybrid Assay, the Next Big Thing by Brand Booth. I know uh, hybrid LBA LC MS was extensively used by industry in discovery stage 
for decision making. But I also heard of at least one sponsor, they are going to submit uh, their uh, application using hybrid LBA LCMS method for a therapeutic indent because in, they encountered a severe specificity issue caused by anti drug antibody. So the take home message is transparency, scientific rationale, and following best practice would help to fill the gap between sponsor and the agency. Thank you. Okay, great. And our, that's a great explanation. Thank you for that. Our next question is for Dr. Shaklea. Are you on the line, Dr. Shaklea? We'll give you a second to connect your microphone. So the question for you is if you can go ahead and discuss the use of eight calibration standards. And we'll just give him a minute to connect. Yes. Yes, thank you. I can hear you now. Yes. yes. Uh, uh, the, the minimum requirement uh, by the guy is, is to have five uh, calibrants, but having more calibrants, uh, that's fine. Uh, if there is any uh, justification for having less or more calibrants, uh, uh, to add, but uh, uh, eight calibrants, uh, if it fits, if it justify your 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 linearity uh, uh, criteria, it should be fine. All right, great, thank you. Another question is about they want to know a little bit more, and if you can clarify system verification and three samples, can you discuss the acceptance criteria? System uh, uh, suitability, uh, we consider this as a, a, a part of the pre-validation or a system check that makes sure that your system is uh, uh, functioning according to the, uh, the expectation every day that you run your validation or you run your uh, sample. Uh, uh, you, when you run the system suitability the first day when you start the validation, your system suitability, the, the solution that, or the standard, the pure standard that you run every day, uh, it should maintain its, uh, the, uh, the main criteria like uh, a peak uh, shape, uh, the area under the curve, uh, the retention time. So that will tell you all how your system is, uh, is, is functioning every day. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you so much for um, shedding more light on that. And our next question for you is, for the aqueous humor analysis, did you validate the assay using a true matrix or did you use a surrogate? If a surrogate was used, how was it prepared? Uh, we, we did uh, use actual uh, matrix. We uh, uh, purchased this from, uh, from uh, uh, a local source that have, uh, which is available, I think, uh, for everybody. Uh, I, I, I don't remember on top of my head the, the name of the company, but, but we did use the uh, actual matrix for the validation, for the full validation. All right, great. And another one, one more for you, Dr. Shaklea. Your sample batch included ULLQ by six. <laughs> I'm saying that right? I know that per the BMV guidance that this is typical for LBA. Are you suggesting that this should be done routinely for small molecule BA validation? Say five replicates. Uh, uh, this is minimum requirement, five replicates, doing more replicates that add to your uh, accuracy and precision, but uh, doing minimum of five replicates, that, uh, that should be fine. Okay, great. Thank you, doctor. Our next question is going to be for Dr. Faustino. Does FDA or do you provide hands-on in-laboratory workshops for method development and validation. Is it possible for a company to send staff who have not validated an assay to get some help? For our um, researchers and our, our assessors, our reviewers, and we do that across theater, 
and I, I teach analytical and bioanalytical method validation, or I have in the past, at um, AAPS. And so if, but to send people to the FDA and to do that, we do have hands-on courses, but those are internal. So if um, there might be a mechanism where we can do that at some point, I have done it externally, of uh, classroom teaching, but hands-on, internal, I'm not sure how that would happen. Not that it couldn't happen, I'm just saying that how would we be able to do that? I do that internally, but externally, there'd probably be a lot of people. There might be one person, but there might be a lot of people. I don't know how we would accommodate that. Okay, great. I, Thank you. I do just would for operating con for system suitability and operating conditions. System suitability is typically one standard, as Dr. Shockley has said. Typically, you had you would have five replicate in injections, and the guiding principles of the guidance talk about bioanalytical method development is to define the operating conditions and system suitability, which is trip traditionally part of ICHQ2R1 or analytical procedures method, valid or method validation. Um, this is something that has started to be used much more in the bioanalytical community. We always do system suitability, obviously, because small molecule in vitro studies, but we always do it both. We do it for bioanalytical studies, and we look at the UV and we look at the mass spec. Um, so we look at the chromatography and we do apply system suitability, and we obviously do that in, um, from the mass spec, mass grams, and things like that. So a minimum of five, and that's based on the statistics. Uh, three will give you standard deviation. Five gives you a relative standard deviation. That's just a clarification. All right. Thank you, Dr. Prestian. We have another question for you. Who at FDA reviews bioanalytical sample analysis reports? Oh, that's the Office of New Drugs, uh, the assessors there, and the bioequivalence assessors in the Office of Generic Drugs. Um, and so those assessors, what we used to call reviewers, those are the people who would review as part of an application that part of the bioanalytical method validation uh, section. Okay, great. And I have another question for Dr. Faustino. And Dr. Zhang and Shaklea, if you'd like to go ahead and look at the questions and flag any or highlight some that you'd like um, think are salient for the audience, that would be great. We can go ahead and, I think, take a couple extra questions we have time for. So for Dr. Faustino, where can we get more information on rapid fire analytics? That's, that's part of a platform in a series of emerging platforms. I, <clears throat> That comes from Agilent. This is not here to make a commercial. I'm, that was Agilent Technologies, market rapid fire, but also there's a system that is five times as fast. So rapid fire can do about 2,000 samples per day. Um, we don't have data analytics to do that, but the new echo mass spec is about five times. We run samples in 10 seconds. Uh, echo mass spec, which is just coming on the market, can run in five five times faster in two seconds, and they, they're they potentially marketing at one second, ten times faster. So if we could do 2,000 per day, you can get the idea in terms of these platforms. These automated platforms offer a lot of opportunity for bioanalysis. We've spent 18 months evaluating uh, the rapid fire platform, the first with a triple quad, and now we're going into three and four dimensional analysis for proteins, for product quality. On the other side, for of assessing as we look more and more into biotherapeutics. So where could you get it? You could go to Agilent, but also SciEx is now marketing the Echo Math spec, but there's a series of other platforms out there. The idea is that these advanced analytics are potentially amazing. There's a lot of challenges, especially with matrix effects, because you don't have um, column chromatography or you don't have a column in between to divert uh, your matrix. and so you. It took us a lot of time to be able to manage the matrix, but tremendous potential for facilitating method development, facilitating method implementation, and obviously rapid analysis of samples. Have fun going to look at, look at the market and see what's out there. Okay, <laughs> great. Thank you so much. 
And we have, I believe it's another question for you. How can I, how can a person prove that their old validation is still? You would do is you do method verification, and that's to revalidate that method. So if you've done a three-day method validation, you have in-study validation, you would re rerun, you would set up a new another method validation run to verify that the method validation run that you did in the method validation that you did in January, that's your method verification, where you're re running a one-day method validation work that the method is doing what it's intended to do, I should say, which is the definition of analytical method validation. And that means going through accurate, all the validation characteristics, accuracy, precision, linearity, specificity, et cetera. OK, great. Thank you so much, Dr. Faustino, Dr. Zhang, Dr. Shaklea. We actually are running over time now, so thank you to everyone for their great questions.